last of the Sacred Code lectures for this trimester. And we have two lectures today, both of them on ornament. The first one will be a shorter one, more introductory on the history of ornament and looking at the history of ornament as this play of straight and serpentine lines. Now, we live in Vienna and at the University of Vienna in the late 1800s, you had a professor named Alois Riegel and he wrote the first real study of ornament called Stillfragen or Stillfragen, uh, which is questions of style. <clears throat> And he basically pursued ornament through history, beginning with ancient prehistoric uh, basket weaving and things like this, and how uh, those patterns in rug making and, and uh, textiles and basket weaving led to certain patterns and shapes and forms. And this traversed history with the Egyptians, Babylonians, Greeks, up until uh, the Saracens and, and uh, the period moving from the Saracens to the medieval, the Gothics. So we'll have a brief look at that. Uh, another important Viennese who spoke about ornament was this fellow, Adolf Loos. And at the turn of the century, he wrote this important manifesto called uh, Ornament und Verbrechen, Ornament and Crime. And it's basically his idea is that any form of ornament is a crime. <laughs> so uh, he essentially brought an end to ornament in Vienna for quite a while. And that's a sad thing because we live here in Vienna. If you walk through the streets of Vienna, you discover that it is indeed a city of ornament. These are the lions outside the uh, Schweizer Tor in the uh, Hofburg Palace who greet us or greets me every day as I walk to the academy. And uh, you cannot walk into a building without finding uh, caryatids, these human figures buttressing and supporting, uh, the, replacing the columns. <clears throat> and here's more examples of caryatids that you find all over Vienna. In this case, this is from the parliament over here on the left. Uh, Another motif, now this is from near the uh, Zentralfriedhof, uh, these spewers as they're called, and we'll come back to these as typical ornamental motifs, but uh, in this case spewing out vegetation or water or some form of abundance. You can find <clears throat> those all over Vienna. Her uh, heraldic motifs, uh, the sphinx that you find here, uh, very typical, and on the right, that's a photo from the Schatzkammer, not too far from here. Uh, a very heraldic lion in textile. And this is actually from the Akademie der Bildende Künste. It's a, directly on the wall of the Akademie, uh, two griffins surrounding a palmette, which is another typical motif that you'll see in ornament, very typical for Greek culture. And here is the uh, parliament building in Vienna and uh, griffins surrounding the, and ornamenting the parliament building in Vienna. So we live in a city of ornament here and it is perhaps worthwhile to understand ornament a bit better. And the way I'm going to approach it is, as I said, through this play of straight and serpentine lines. And this, in fact, goes all the way back to, for example, uh, the tops of Greek columns, the capitals, <clears throat> and this progression from the Doric to the Ionic and to the Corinthian. Uh, each capital is unique and adorns different architectural structures and temples in ancient Greece. And each one has a story, which is given to us by Vitru Vitruvius in uh, De Architectura, beginning with the Doric column. And he writes, uh, the formation of columns come in three styles, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, of which the Doric came first. For in Achaia, Doris was king and built a temple in the sanctuary of Juno when the determination of exact proportions had not yet begun. Thus, not having any proportion, they measured Doris's footstep and applied it to his height, finding that the foot was one-sixth the part of the height. <clears throat> 
and so they applied this proportion to the column. In this way, the Doric column began with the proportion of a man's body with its strength and grace. So there you have typical examples of Doric columns, and as you can see, they're quite thick and heavy, proportion of one to six. And this gets contrasted then by the Ionic columns, which, as we'll see, are much more feminine. Uh, Vitruvius goes on to write, Afterwards, seeking to build a temple of Diana in a new style, they changed it to a feminine slenderness, making the diameter an eighth part of the column's height, so it might appear taller. At the column's capital, they put volutes, like graceful curling hair, and over the column's length, they let fluting fall, like the folds of a woman's robes. Thus, they proceeded to the invention of columns in two manners, one manlike in appearance, bare, unadorned, the other feminine. So when we look at these columns, perhaps we don't think of it as specifically masculine or feminine, but that's definitely the way it was viewed uh, in ancient Greece. <clears throat> and then we come to the final one, the Corinthian column, and this comes with an interesting story. Uh, this is the acanthus leaf you see on the left over here, and the acanthus leaf ends up adorning the, the Corinthian columns, and we'll see uh, how and in what way. A girl, a native of Corinth, already of age to be married, suffered a disease and died. After her funeral, her wet nurse carried a basket of her favorite goblets to her tomb monument and placed it there with a tile on top to protect it from the elements. She did not notice that it lay upon the root of an acanthus. Springtime came, and the acanthus put forth its leaves and shoots, which grew up the sides of the basket. And being pressed down at the angles by the tile, they were compelled to form the curves of volutes at the extremes. So what you're actually seeing at the top, then, of the column is this tile that was weighing down on the acanthus plant, and the acanthus plant was growing around this basket and so on that was pressed um, onto, the, uh, onto the tomb of this young girl. So interesting story, and definitely the Corinthian column is perhaps the most decorative, the most lively of all three columns. I also want to talk about uh, what's called the egg and dart motif, and that's what you see over here on the bottom right, basically egg, dart, egg, dart, and so on. And as you can see, it's a fairly abstract uh, motif. Now, it wasn't always the case. As, as ornament develops through time, sometimes it loses its uh, complexity and, and uh, rhythmic lines. In fact, the origins of the egg and dart motif, we can go back to Egypt where you have the lotus and you have the open lotus and then you have the closed lotus or the bud and then the open lotus again and these, these repeat as a pattern. And so it was in fact the open and closed lotus uh, as it became increasingly simplified over time that led to this egg and dart motif. And if you go, I believe I took this photo in the Ephesus Museum. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the Ephesus Museum here in Vienna, you'll see again, egg and dart motif here, very abstract. But you have this similar kind of palmette with its budding palmette and full flowered palmette budding and so on back and forth. So the lesson then is that uh, even in ancient Greece, we went from the straight to the spiraling or serpentine, that uh, the Doric column was unadorned, was perfectly straight without any kind of serpentine line. But by the time we got to the Corinthian capital, you have those beautiful acanthus leaves swirling around, uh, creating this very serpentine idea. We're going to jump ahead now to uh, the Arab period and uh, the decorations that you have from that period. And you can see in this animation how a series of straight lines are put down and then over the straight lines the decoration occurs which is in fact this serpentine line that we were talking about. And uh, if we watch this animation one more time, I think I can do it. Let's see, no, okay. But um, 
In fact, circles are being placed around the, square, the straight lines. And from those circles, that's how they're developing these serpentine lines. And it's really the play of straight, diagonal, and circles which is creating this design that we end up seeing here. A very balanced, very symmetrical design, but um, organized with underlying principles which you no longer see. Those principles being the straight, diagonal, and even the circles uh, to create all those different serpentine spirals and leaves and so on. And that was certainly the case with the Gothic style as well, and that uh, the Islamic uh, patterns and the Islamic designs that you find uh, from the late 800 to 1100 and later influenced Gothic style, which started in the 1100s. And uh, even with something, this is called late Gothic, the flamboyant period here. Even with something like that, it's not arbitrary that there is a geometry underlying all of these flamboyant flames that you see in the tracery of this uh, tympanum of the architecture right here. <clears throat> Uh, we have met with Villard de Ancourt already in this class. He left behind his notebooks from uh, around 1220. And it gives you a peek into the thoughts of a mason or architect from that period. And you can see that uh, he has, in one place in his notebooks, drawn an Archimedean spiral here. And that Archimedean spiral then became the foundation for a lot of the different designs, like this pelican, which is uh, pecking at its own breast to release its blood to feed its children, a symbol of Christ. Uh, or this is a design for a choir stall. And this dragon over here. Again, spirals based on geometry. And the geometry flows through until it disappears as an abstract shape and becomes an animal, vegetation, or some kind of uh, heraldic beast. So let's take a little journey through the last uh, 1,100 years or so. And uh, we can see that as we go from the Gothic period, this is in Italy, the Cathedral of Milan on the left, to say the baptistry in Florence in the Renaissance, that the entire aim of Renaissance architecture was to get rid of all of those unnecessary curly cues and tendrils and spirals that you see in the Gothic style. For them, in the Renaissance, the aim was towards a certain geometric simplicity, which, as we said, underlay the Gothic style but now we're taking away the ornaments and seeing basically the geometric structures. If we go to the interior, this is the interior of uh, the Stephansdom in Vienna on the upper left, compared to the Vatican Library in Rome. You can see the same thing that they basically, there is still definitely ornament in the Renaissance period, but they've eliminated a lot of the curves and, and um, extra little uh, elements that would somehow stop your eye and attract your eye. Uh, rather, the straight lines allow your eye to move straight down the perspective without being stopped by or impeded by any kind of decorative element. But that movement towards simplicity and straight lines and so on didn't last very long because the Baroque period came fairly soon after the end of the High Renaissance. And with the Baroque period, they wanted to come back to all that delightful uh, vegetal elements that uh, attract the eye and allow us to pause and move around in a fairly circular way. If you compare these two interiors, uh, the upper left is a Renaissance interior, and the bottom right is a Baroque interior. You can see what I mean, that uh, the simplicity and I can argue grace of uh, the Renaissance interior is now uh, changed by as if we had taken nature itself, painted it gold, and placed it in the interior of this Baroque room. Luscious, uh, full of wonder for the eye. <clears throat> 
The Baroque period could not last forever, and it was uh, superseded by the neoclassical style. And the neoclassical style, of course, wanted to go back to a certain elegance and simplicity. So we go back to the straight line. You can see that, for example, here with this uh, Louis Kahn's style of furniture of a chair and uh, interiors which have a touch of decoration uh, here and there with certain moldings and bas-reliefs, but otherwise uh, aiming towards simplicity. Jumping through time to the Jugendstil and uh, Art Nouveau uh, period, Art Nouveau being an English word because in France it's simply called uh, the modern style, and uh, in places like Paris, like Prague and like Vienna, you could have this flowering now of a very graceful line. Uh, the Secession building you see in the bottom here and Alphonse Mucha on the left. Another important center for Art Nouveau was Barcelona, where you had Antoni Gaudi and his famous uh, Sagrada Familia Cathedral, which is still being built today. And it is probably the only cathedral to be built in the Jungensteel style. Uh, we do have churches and so on as well. And you can see that the, the human steel has that liquid-like quality, softness. Uh, Salvador Dali called it soft architecture. He was a big fan of Gaudi. Um, Alphonse Mucha, who lived most of his life in Paris, but was Czech and returned to Prague at the end of his life, uh, was a master of the uh, modern style. He even wrote a book, uh, Document, Document Décoratif, where he explained uh, his theories behind uh, this decorative style. Here in Vienna, our Jungenstil architect, our favorite one is Otto Wagner, who uh, a lot of his buildings were on the point of being destroyed because they were considered to be uh, not very valuable. And uh, fortunately, they were saved. Um, his church, the Otto Wagner Kirche, you see in the middle here with the detail at the top, this famous uh, Karlsplatz U-Bahn Station and the Otto Wagner Villa in Hütteldorf. That was his own villa. And as we know, it, was, uh, it fell into ruin, actually. And then it was uh, acquired by Ernst Fuchs and it became his private museum as well as his home. So Otto Wagner then being perhaps the last greatest um, representative of this decorative style, it's, it's still very much straight line, but there is decoration. There are decorative elements. He liked the gold, he liked the ornament. And uh, he worked towards the end of the 1800s working for the Emperor of Austria and was very much a representative of the, um, of the epoch that we had of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Adolf Loos, and we can even see in his appearance, represents the turning of the century into modernism. And modernism was really born here in Vienna. Sigmund Freud, Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, Gustav Klimt, Egon Schiele, a lot of these writers and thinkers were responsible for a new spirit of thinking. And uh, Adolf Loos was a part of that. If you look at him compared to, say, uh, oops, I'll go back, compared to Otto Wagner, Here's Otto Wagner, his mustache is curled up, he has facial hair, he has at least three or four layers of clothing. That was you know, typical for a bourgeois gentleman in the late 1800s. Uh, with the turning of the century, there was a movement towards simplicity, less facial hair, no long hair, the hair was cut short. Uh, a philosopher like Ludwig Wittgenstein didn't even wear a tie. He had an open collar shirt. And this was considered to be revolutionary. Uh, not wearing a hat. 
that for a man to go out in public without a hat was considered to be very extreme, and yet they went out in public without hats, right? So this was their kind of radical rebellion against the old ruling epoch, which collapsed, right? That <clears throat> with, this, with the First World War, uh, the entire Austrian-Hungarian Empire collapsed. And part of that revolution then was Adolf Loos, and he built this building here at Michaelaplatz. So it is exactly opposite the Hofburg uh, Palace, which being the symbol of the Habsburg monarchy. And he designed it in such a way that, aside from these flowers which you see here today, basically there is no ornament, there's no decoration uh, around any of the windows. <clears throat> and this was considered to be uh, blasphemous at the time. The, the emperor proclaimed, it has no eyebrows. And uh, people couldn't quite figure out what he was getting at. But for him, as you can see, ornament und verbrechen, that ornament was a crime. And he basically uh, declared that uh, there are those who cannot distinguish the difference between an urn and a piss pot. And uh, one should be used you know, for functionality, the other should be used for decoration, but people confuse them all the time. So he also created the uh, Museum Cafe, which is practically beside the Secession building, uh, which was, again, another symbol of the human steel. So he was constantly creating these, these uh, works of architecture, which promoted a new style, and that new style being simple, straight lines, simplicity, with no ornament whatsoever. And you can see here, this is one of his interiors, uh, that basically our, our, our modern conception accepts this interior, as, as, uh, but at the time it was revolutionary. And if the Jungian Steel period had persisted through the 20th century, we would end up perhaps with more interiors like Alphonse Mucha that you see over here on the left. But that quickly went out of style with the turning of the 1900s. Uh, the wars had an important role to play in all this because uh, through the war, you had to find the most effective way to build a building. And of course, it takes less time to build a building that has straight lines and so on. So this Bauhaus style, uh, which is basically uh, in German, if you see a building that has no decoration, it's called Neubau, that it was these hastily constructed buildings after the Second World War, lacking any form of ornament because they didn't have the time. And so in a certain sense, Manifestos like this one, the form ohne ornament, form without ornament, uh, justify this movement towards pure functionality in architecture. The form following the function, so to speak, the form uh, being the, the, sorry, the function giving it the form, basically. Now, not everyone thought like that in the 20th century, and one of the exceptions was Rudolf Steiner who was another Austrian. And he built the Gotteneum in, uh, I guess it was Austria, close to Switzerland, I believe, but in Austria, Dornach. And you can see uh, it was entirely built of wood and used the curvatures and the natural proportions and energies moving through the wood to create this very beautiful uh, rounded serpentine style of architecture. Alas, uh, he was not on the right side of, well, it's a relative term, right or wrong, but he was not on the side, the winning side during the Nazi era. And uh, so the Nazis are the ones who burn down basically this entire structure. It no longer exists. And with National Socialism in uh, Europe, you get architecture like you see here. And National Socialism, obviously, clearly, prefers this straight line architecture. It's monumental, it's huge, uh, and it's very imposing, but it lacks that feeling of nature, if you will. Uh, the Haus der Kunst in Munich is one of the surviving buildings from the Nazi era. This uh, eagle here is actually 
at one of the gates to the Hofburg here in Vienna, one of the few surviving uh, decorations or ornaments from the Nazi era in Vienna. Personally, I think it's a good thing to leave ornaments from history behind and not destroy every trace of what happened through history. The Viennese then in the post-World War II generation naturally rebelled against National Socialism and uh, one of the greatest rebels against all this was Hundertwasser, Friedensreich Hundertwasser. And he wrote his own manifesto, Verschimmelungsmanifest gegen den Rationalismus in der Architektur. Verschimmelungs being uh, moldiness, going moldy, uh, when something is left to rot and change and metamorphose. And uh, he was all in favor of, as you can see, the, the, the bent ruler, getting rid of any kind of straight line and moving towards all sorts of curves and swirls and spirals and so on. He was especially fond of the spiral in his paintings. So uh, with Hundertwasser, then we have that, that final, if you want, uh, say against the straight line and some kind of movement towards the curving line. Our own Professor Ernst Fuchs has also uh, journeyed into architecture. He acquired the Otto Wagner Villa, but next door he created his own architectural structure, the Nymphaeum Omega Chapel. And uh, he also wrote a book called Architectura Celestis, Images of the Hidden Prime of Styles, where he explains a lot of his theories about architecture. And for him, uh, architecture was not so much a protest against any kind of period in history, rather it was an attempt to go back to all the periods of history and find the core elements that have existed and persisted through time. Uh, so he's not afraid, for example, in his Nymphium Omega Chapel to give you a uh, column capital, excuse me. And uh, you can see in this column capital that uh, he's returned to the idea of something like an acanthus leaf, that there is vegetation that's growing. He's, he's elongated it in a fairly Jugendstil style. He was a child of the Jugendstil era and uh, always kept that in his work. Um, we'll come back to this face in a moment. Two faces in profile joining as one face and then here as we see spewing forth some kind of liquid. So he was very much aware of the history of ornament and the history of architecture and trying to revive in his own unique way a lot of those elements. Uh, the interior of the Otto Wagner Villa has his paintings, but also his furniture. And he became interested in furniture design and designed furniture as well as many other things, fashion and tapestries, wallpaper. The wallpaper which you see, and these photos are taken directly from the wallpaper in the Ernst Fuchs Villa, uh, give you an idea of his decorative uh, tendency, very much inspired by Alois Riegel's book on ornament and, uh, and pursuing the laws of ornament, which is to say that uh, heraldry, symmetry, uh, profiles, these all play an important role. And you can see the symmetry, for example, in this design here. Very vibrant with beautiful curving lines, but it's not totally chaotic, right? There are certain principles underlying these designs that give them a certain order. So I would like to finish this uh, talk then with some examples of ornament. But I will use the work of Ernst Fuchs as kind of a thread to find our way through the labyrinth of ornament. And uh, looking at plant, hieratic plant and hieratic animal motifs, the word hieratic, the word hieratic referring to the sacred traditions through time, uh, as we've seen in Babylonian, Egyptian, 
ancient Greek, uh, as well as, let's say, Byzantine and Gothic cultures, <clears throat> as opposed to the humanist, which we saw in our other lectures. So as hieratic, it tries to evoke a kind of sacred calm, and it does that through symmetry. <clears throat> and here he's respected the laws of symmetry. He's respected the way in which these shoots flow up high from their foundation below, um, <clears throat> creating this almost fountain-like effect of vegetation. This is Ernst Fuchs on the left. That's a Greek ornament on the right, which is at least from 2,000 years ago. And you can see that the same principles have been used uh, from one epoch to the next. Same with this motif here, again, from the architecture in the Ernst Fuchs villa. And that gentle curving, almost as if it were underwater. Uh, and yet, you can sense that all of these um, leaves are flowing or moving around certain lines that are not evident, but present nonetheless to create the symmetry and the movement. And this was a principle which survived all the way through Islamic ornament, medieval ornament, and so on, that even though they were depicting a tree or some kind of uh, plant, it always maintained symmetry and so maintained a certain sacred quality. They're, they shied away from uh, total randomness in the representations of vegetation. Uh, moving on to the depiction of animals. Um, this is a painting which you can find by Ernst Fuchs in the Ernst Fuchs Villa. And this is a detail of the painting called Under the Sign of Moses. And you have this slumbering beast who is clearly inspired, I think, from Sumerian and Babylonian um, decoration. And this is actually a very small little sculpture, which I photographed in the Louvre and in Paris. And uh, he has a larger, older brother, which are the famous, famous uh, winged door guardians from uh, Babylonia. And <clears throat> these winged bulls, massive, immense, uh, hieratic, that they, per perceiving uh, the animal as the archetypal guardian, such as even uh, the angelic beings in the heavens assuming the form of lions and griffins and bulls. <clears throat> Another motif by Ernst Fuchs, which you see here, kind of interesting creature with its tail in its mouth, being called the Euroboros, any creature with its tail in its mouth, having the uh, element of a unicorn, as well as an interesting little egg on its head. Now, when he drew this figure, he was still following certain principles that are always at work in ornament. If we go to the Bayeux Tapestry, which uh, basically uh, documents William the Conqueror and his conquest of England, <clears throat> uh, you can see that in this time period, 1070, if they were going to depict an animal, and you get these animal motifs all along the top and bottom, that first of all, the animal is in profile. And that was the simplest way to depict the animal in profile. But having depicted the animal in profile, they then preferred to use a kind of an S curve that would flow through the animal. And uh, we could see this S curve with vegetation as well, that, that typically vegetation moves in S curves. And then they would transfer that to the animal so that the head was turned back. And by turning the head back, you're able to get this S curve. And you'll see that it becomes a very common motif to make the head turn back to create that S-like shape, which Fuchs is following here. Um, as well as, you know, here, obviously, he's about to consume his own tail. Uh, 
that being a kind of a symbol of uh, infinity, but also the self-devouring that all of nature is a devouring element. <clears throat> Another example of uh, a sacred animal in the work of Ernst Fuchs is this beautiful eagle um, <clears throat> perched on the hands of Solomon. This is King Solomon on the right. And the simplicity of line, the graceful movement of line, is something which we can also find in the Gothic period in medieval times. This is from Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, one of my photographs. Uh, and I photographed it because I was very intrigued by the way in which Gothic sculptors were able to uh, carve, here you get this interesting beast, carve out the face with a minimum amount of lines. Yeah? And each line that they did was a very graceful uh, line. That is perhaps uh, one of the hardest things to do in ornament is create a certain um, movement within the figure with a minimum amount of lines. And uh, I'm sure that uh, if there were any Egyptian sculptures in France in the Gothic period, and probably there, uh, actually there would not have been, but maybe some got traded uh, that far, they would have found inspiration in uh, the Egyptian style because the Egyptian style has that same graceful uh, carving to the most simple lines, the S lines, the C lines, and the curves. Just to finish off with a couple of more, um, this is another painting by Ernst Fuchs, which you can find in the villa. And at the bottom of this painting, you see these three Griffins and griffins, as we have seen, are one of the favorite heraldic creatures of Vienna. They appear at the uh, Academie der Bildenden Künste. They appear uh, in the Parliament of Austria. And they appear repeatedly in the work of Ernst Fuchs as well. Uh, in this painting here, you have that little creature at the bottom, which we see over here. There's a serpent and he's raised his paw, perhaps in order to defeat the serpent, but the raised paw being in fact an element of heraldry and uh, Ernst Fuchs explained to me that he was indeed, as a child, totally enamored by heraldry and used to draw for hours and hours heraldic motifs. The ultimate heraldic motif in Austria being the double-headed eagle because uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a double monarchy that uh, the emperor of Austria was also the king of Hungary. And so that was symbolized by an eagle with two heads. And this idea of the two-headed eagle, we find it everywhere we go in Vienna, but Ernst Fuchs also became enamored by this image and he would use the double-headed eagle uh, in his work. This humble, unfinished painting from his youth is called Myself as the Emperor of Austria. I would like to uh, finish then with this final, if you want, a beautiful image by Ernst Fuchs of a double-headed eagle. And it kind of uh, explains or manifests how his style did achieve that um, prime, that hidden prime of styles that he was searching throughout his life to try and find a style which traversed all epochs of history. And it's not definitely Gothic, it's not definitely Babylonian, it's not definitely uh, Greek, but somehow it is that one style which has traversed all of history and manifest all those different styles at one and the same time. So uh, I don't know if we can ever find the hidden prime of styles. It's kind of like an ideal that every uh, ornament and every work of art strives to achieve. But 
uh, I think when you look at this piece by Ernst Fuchs, it's like we've come very close to, to reaching this archetypal, archetypal image of the dead, double-headed eagle. All right, thank you for listening for the first lecture. And we'll have another lecture shortly after this to conclude. Thank you very much. <laughs>